challenging times, and she took upon herself in a very ambitious program with regard to education, social welfare, labor, health, and associated issues, including the uh, status of women. She herself uh, is the daughter, as you know, of a prime minister. She was educated at Oxford, was the first Asian woman to be president of the Oxford Union. Happily, we can say she was educated at Harvard as well. Received an honorary degree at Harvard in 1989, uh, at which time she gave a stirring commencement speech. She's the author of a number of books, has won many international prizes, the International Leadership Award, the Bruno Christ and Human Rights Award, and many others. And today she remains a major figure in political affairs, both in Pakistan and beyond. Uh, our time today is somewhat limited, so we hopefully will have a chance for a few questions, but uh, uh, we should probably turn now directly to the program. Welcome, Dr. Bhutto. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we gather this afternoon at a time when democracy is on the move. There have been elections in Iraq, there have been elections in Palestine, and I yearn for the day when real elections can take place in my country, Pakistan. So it is in a spirit of triumph, of liberty, that I meet with you who are going to be the leaders of tomorrow. You are the successor generation of world leadership, those who will shape the world in the first true generation of the global economy and an interna interconnected international community. I was at Harvard at a time when apartheid haunted South Africa. And I believe that if apartheid can crumble in South Africa, racism, sexism, and bigotry can crumble in every corner of this planet. I stand here with you in the epicenter of freedom, of world freedom. Yet the world is still complex. It is a world that defies simple solutions, a world that is very much in transition from one set of political realities to another. We live in an age traumatized by terror, an age defined by the attacks on the World Trade Centers. We fight a war against terrorism. We discuss possibilities of chemical and biological attacks. We worry too about the loss of our privacy, of our civil liberties, and the cost of war on countries like Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere. And I travel to Harvard at a time which is difficult <coughs> for my country. And in light of your education, I hope that you will open your hearts to the suffering of my people. The disintegration of democracy in Pakistan did not come overnight, and it did not come in one military coup. Since my government was overthrown in 1996, Pakistan has drifted in a sea of conflict and violence, an agenda of vengeance and a hijacking of democracy. The military said it stepped in to restore order and democracy in our nation, but it has succeeded in neither. To tighten their grip on political opposition, the president of Pakistan was toppled, the judges were sacked, and journalists were assaulted. For the people of Pakistan, <coughs> for my party, my family, and myself, the dictatorial years have seemed like a nightmare. Last month, on April 16th, tens of thousands of our supporters, including women and children, were arrested and taken <coughs> to prison. The prisons simply weren't large enough to keep all of them in, 
So the tanks were put up in the prison grounds and people were held on deaths. In a country where men don't shake hands with women, male police pulled women by the hair and kept them down for 15 minutes, twisted their arms, fractured their legs to cause them pain and humiliation. Three women parliamentarians were so maltreated by the male police that they ended up suffering heart attacks and were hospitalized. They're crying to go to the airport to receive an opposition leader. Supporters of democracy and human rights are forced into exile. I know it is now the fashion in the developed and developing world to destroy leaders' reputations by innuendo, by allegation, and rumor. The strategy even has a name. It's called the politics of personal destruction. But the scale to which this was orchestrated in Pakistan against my party <coughs> defies anything seen elsewhere in the world. It was a relentless, devastating, and overt assault on justice in an attempt to undermine the Pakistan People's Party. I was pressured and humiliated in increasingly desperate attempts to force me to quit politics. My husband was accused of even more ridiculous and scurrilous charges, including the unspeakable slander of murdering my own brother. And his father was arrested to pressure him. I used to think, naively, that an election alone could change things for the better. But now I realize that a country needs more than democratic elections. It needs the rule of law. Democracy is not just a process for elections. Democracy is a process of governing. An election can bring into being a new parliament and a new government, but it cannot bring in a new judiciary, a new bureaucracy, or a new intelligence apparatus. It cannot give acknowledgement to the victims of tyranny, to those who lost their lives, their livelihoods, their families, their peace of mind. It cannot undo the pain and damage caused by torture, imprisonment, or exile. So I believe that an edifice built without law collapses just as a skyscraper <coughs> built without the foundation will ultimately crumble. <coughs> Pakistan is in turmoil. We lack judicial institutions, political institutions that can be responsive to our people and which can promote stability inside Pakistan and within the region. And Pakistan is no ordinary country. It is a nation that detonated six nuclear devices in 1998. It is a country that has fought three wars in the last more than 50 years of its history. And it's a country that nearly went to war in 1999 over the frozen wastelands of an area called Kargil. It's a country of desperately poor people, <coughs> rich in weapons of mass destruction. It is a country where powerful drug lords undermine civil rule by faced <coughs> with extradition. Moderation in pursuit of justice is no virtue. It is a country where men still kill women in the name of honor. And these moral and legal predictions so severe threaten to suffocate the state itself. In this, the 21st century, the people of Pakistan yearn for the restoration of their right to elect a government of their choice. A government that can address the issues of poverty, of gender equality, of minority rights. These are issues which are crying for attention. The story of Pakistan did not have to turn out this way. And I'm convinced, because I'm an optimist, that ultimately things 
will be different. The democratic Pakistan I led did its best to create a modern Pakistan. With the support of the people, we marketed our country as a crossroads to the Gulf, to South Asia, and to Central Asia. We advanced Pakistan as an example of a moderate Islamic state. And we committed ourselves, especially to education, by building tens of thousands of primary schools across the country. We committed ourselves to immunization of our children and our children's health. As a young mother, I felt particularly concerned about the plight of small children in Pakistan. We transformed the country into a center for financial investment, creating jobs and wealth. When I took over as Prime Minister of Pakistan, our people had to wait 20 years to get a telephone line. We used to have power shutdowns that lasted for 13, for 13 hours at a time. And I wondered how people without access to telephones or electricity could set up businesses of their own and help advance our economy. So we invested in electricity. We invested in power plants. We invested in drinking water. We invested in building roads. We invested <coughs> in infrastructure. But military hardliners that had fought the Afghan Jihad and were sympathetic to the Taliban idea of repression against women destabilized <coughs> my government. It is at such times that the mettle of leadership is truly tested. Ironically, but repeatedly, history tells us that the best of leadership is constructed in the worst of times. Crises create opportunities and qualities that otherwise lie dormant. The question before my, my nation is, how many will suffer imprisonment, deprivation, discrimination, and perhaps death? before justice and the forces of history restore the democratic order. And although I know not the answer to that question, I know it is my obligation to lead this battle, no matter what the personal price, to restore a democratic Pakistan. This is not the life I necessarily would have chosen for myself. But it's a life that life chose for me. And in the words of President John Kennedy, I, I do not shrink from this responsibility. I welcome it. I have found, ladies and gentlemen, that leadership is not about being safe. It is about being bold. Leadership is about speaking out for what you believe in. Leadership is about making a moral choice, speaking out for principles that you believe in, speaking out for values that you believe in. And leadership is also about forcing choices, drawing lines in the sand. The sense of justice, the sense of outrage, the sense of expectation, that a citizen feels in one country can, can have a profound effect in another. I have found that as I travel to different cities to address members of the Pakistani expatriate community. And as I struggle for my people, I drive, derive great courage from this global reinforcement. From the expatriate community here in America and across the world, which has given me the strength and support and given my party the strength and support to continue its struggle for democracy in Pakistan. Pakistan is a country where the forces of tyranny, terrorism, proliferation and a militant interpretation of Islam by the margins mingle to create a very difficult challenge. The international community through its weight behind Pakistan's military ruler, 
following the terrorist attacks of the World Trade Centers. There are worries, though, that the inability of the international community to facilitate Pakistan's transition to civilian rule could undermine its objectives in the long run. Pakistan's military and clerical class were the two organizations that were used to train the Mujahideen against the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan in the 80s. Following the withdrawal of the Soviets, the Afghan Mujahideen went on to become, in large parts, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Pakistan's military dictatorship has concluded in the domination of our political and financial and social class by the military. And military dictatorship has also coincided with the rise of religious parties. The religious parties publicly claim to be friends of Mullah Omar and Osama bin Laden. They have filled the political vacuum caused by the military regime's determination to sideline the two major parties of the country which are modeled and believe in a parliamentary <coughs> system of government. Pakistan's military ruler has vested the presidency with enormous powers. He argued <coughs> that a constitutionally strong president would help take the military back to the barracks and prevent another martial law. But this hasn't happened. Last December, despite the presidency having such enormous powers, General Musharraf decided that he needed to keep both the offices of the president and the chief of army staff. The October 2002 elections which General Musharraf held were, contra were controversial. There were widespread allegations of rigging. And it is unsurprising to me that General Musharraf was unable to take the military back to the barracks, given the fact that those rigged elections produced a weak and unrepresentative political system. For me, a military president of Pakistan sends the wrong message to more than 1.2 billion Muslims in the world regarding the reasons for the war against terror. President Bush said that this was a war for the values of freedom. Prime Minister Blair of England said this was not a war between religions but against oppression and against tyranny. The democratization of Pakistan is important to the war against terrorism, to the interpretation of Islam as a message of freedom and enlightenment, as well as to the empowerment of ordinary Pakistanis. I see a Muslim world in flux. <coughs> I see the children of many of the affluent middle class families in the Muslim world study in state run schools. And they grew up often under ruthless dictatorships who use the intelligence services to raid homes, pick up people, torture them, imprison them. And even as political freedoms were denied, social and economic progress remained a dream. And while the elites tried, the masses were mired in poverty, hunger, and unemployment. The mainstream political parties were stopped from functioning. The safe place for people to gather was the mosque. And so every Friday, people went to the mosque to pray. And every Friday, they went to the mosque to hear what the <coughs> imam or the leader of the mosque had to say. Well, the leader of the mosque was frightened of the military regime too, and he couldn't talk very much about the despair and the discontentment that the people felt inside the country. So at the mosque, the leaders would often speak against those who supported the dictatorship, and this was often the West. And so a Cold War generation of youth grew up in the Muslim world, hearing about the denial of nationhood to Palestine, the lack of self-determination for Kashmir, and the denial of autonomy to the Chechens. They learned of a Muslim past based on conquest and war. They learned little or nothing about the Muslim Renaissance that saw giant leaps forward in medicine, 
in astronomy, in mathematics, literature, and science. And when they went to the mosque, they imbibed the lesson that the return to the simple, austere life of the past could once again rekindle the courage and the passion that saw Islam sweep across the continents to knock on the doors of Europe. The theocratic state, disciplined under a single religious figure, was presented as the path to victory. Victory against the temptations of the soul. Victory against the injustices perpetuated by the bigger powers. And it is this embittered generation that must be rescued with an alternative political model to that of the theocratic state. And in my view, that alternative political model <coughs> is a democratic model. Tragically, despite a clear commitment to democracy, most Muslim people today are living in one form of dictatorship or another. And it worries me when I see crimes being committed against women, especially in Pakistan. This year there was a report that an army captain took part in the gang rape of a lady doctor. It took weeks of public protest before he was finally arrested. And even after he was arrested, the regime sided with the rapist, claiming he was innocent than rather than with the victim. For me, this inability to distinguish between the exploiter and the exploited, between the victim and the victimizer, is the best example of the difference between a dictatorship and a democracy. Muslim countries today are in search of leaders that can revitalize them with the principles of freedom. Countries like Indonesia, Philippines, Pakistan, we had long histories of authoritarian rule. And these are the countries that now face some of the most intense terrorist activity, terrorist threat. This is the counter picture of countries. And I would like an answer. There are people who in the 20th century said that authoritarian rule was good. But this is the counter picture to what authoritarian rule produced. The Asian tigers were once cited as examples of societies with growing economies and dictatorship was defended. But time demonstrated that such dictatorships actually created a crony class and did not benefit the masses. It led to a human rights deficit. The alternative argument is that the rise of lawlessness and terrorism witnessed in countries with long period of authoritarianism demonstrates a link between terrorism and a political system. By suspending the majesty of law, by taking over by force, by ruling through repression, military dictators and authoritarian rulers gave birth to the culture of obtaining power through violence. Today, a military dictatorship in Islamabad exploits the war against terror to keep itself in power at the cost of the constitutional rights of the people of Pakistan. Many in Pakistan now refuse to vote, believing that irrespective of how they vote, the result will be doctored. And I find this dangerous for Pakistan's democratic future. I believe that we must learn lessons of the past. The fundamental mistake contributing to a long-term political calamity was our inability to foster Afghan democracy when the Soviets withdrew from Afghanistan in the 80s. If you look at history, democracies do not go to war against other democracies, just as democracies do not sponsor international terrorism. A democratic Afghanistan in the 80s would have marginalized the Taliban and the Samas of this world long before the attack on the World Trade Centers. And we must not make the same mistake again today in Pakistan, a country which has nuclear power. 
I believe that fresh party-based elections open to all parties and personalities. With international monitors, an independent election commission, electoral modalities that are transparent, an account that is immediate, open, and accurately reflects the sentiments of the people, could settle issues of legitimacy, which now complicate Pakistan's position in the 21st century. The controversial October elections of 2002 have failed to combat poverty. They have failed to reform the judiciary. They have failed to reform Pakistan's educational system and have given rise to regional discontent. A Balochistan liberation movement has begun in the province of Balochistan. And this kind of militancy can spread in the other alienated minority provinces. When elections in the Ukraine were rigged, the international community supported fresh elections, and I believe the time has come to support fresh elections, fresh early elections in Pakistan. The American Human Rights Watch declared that the 2002 elections had the death stacked against the democratic forces. Pakistan's stability is important for us who are Pakistanis, but it's also important for the international community. Two assassination attempts on General Musharraf demonstrate the thin thread on which the alliance of the international community with Musharraf is built. In the war against terrorism, the greatest protection of freedom from ter terrorists comes from replacing dictatorships with governments that are responsive to the needs of the people, governments that believe in liberty. The stakes are high. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a very nostalgic feeling for me to come back to Harvard University. Some of the best years of my life were spent on this campus, and I hope that all of you are also spending some of the best years of your life on this campus. I had never wished to enter public life. As I mentioned, it was nothing that I sought. I had hoped at Harvard and then at Oxford that I could pursue a career in journalism or perhaps become a diplomat. My ambition was to become a ambassador to Washington. I thought I knew all the best people having been at Harvard and would have all the great parties that one could. <laughs> <laughs> but forces beyond my control shaped the direction of my future. I consider myself a daughter of the East who spent significant parts of my life in the West. And so I see myself as a bridge between two cultures and two worlds. I was 16 years old when my father decided that I should come to Harvard and that I should not be denied the Islamic right of knowledge. And so he sent me to this campus. For me, it's interesting that the person who ensured that I would break loose of the constraints of my culture, the constraints of my gender, was not a woman, but a man. And when I came abroad at the age of 16, it was a true awakening. From Pakistan to Cambridge, Massachusetts, it was a very new world. <coughs> I was alone for the first time in my life. The pampered child was suddenly cooking, cleaning, washing, <laughs> ironing, <laughs> independent and self-sufficient. I was exposed to the most brilliant and respected professors, to the most compelling ideas, to a demanding curriculum, and to the most accomplished students in North America. My father didn't come to the East Coast. He went to the West Coast. But he didn't send me to the West Coast. He sent me to the East Coast because he said it's so sunny on the West Coast that I'd never sit inside in the library and study. So I sat on the East Coast. For the first time, I had to take care of myself and I had to participate in an intellectual village. I was for the first time in an environment where women were treated as full participants in society. I came to Harvard in 1969 at the heart of the Vietnam War with our campus and all of America in political and social turmoil. And while I was in America during those four years, I participated and observed the miracle of democracy. I saw the power of people 
changing policies, changing leaders, and changing the course of history. From Harvard, I went to Oxford, where I became the first foreign woman to be elected as president of the Oxford Union. It was my first election. I had been told that as a foreigner, I could not win and should not run. I had been told that as a woman, I could not win and should not run. But I was young and I thought I could win and I did run and I did win. And I learned a valuable lesson. I learned a valuable lesson never to acquiesce to obstacles, especially those that are constructed of bigotry and intolerance. And I also learned another lesson to follow my own instincts. I returned to Pakistan in 1977, as I said, to join the Foreign Service. But circumstances soon <coughs> unfolded that changed the course of my life. Within one week of my return from Oxford University, a military coup toppled the elected government of my father. Our house was surrounded by tanks. We did not know if he would live or die, if he would survive to see the dawn of the next day's sun. I still remember my mother's voice in the dark saying, get up, get up, the military had taken over. My father was arrested, released, re-arrested, and finally hanged. My party was targeted, our leaders were murdered, tortured, and imprisoned. And it was in this political vacuum that the people and the leaders of my party turned towards me to lead them. I did not see leadership. It was thrust upon me. I was fortunate in my campaign to lead my nation. My name was recognized throughout the country. And the people who had supported my father supported my leadership. Exposure to modern ideas, to a liberal education, in some of the best schools of the world had certainly helped me prepare to play the role of a leader. But it was the real practical education that I received from my father who took great interest in my upbringing, who initiated me in debates which prepared me the most. But I had no control over the events which changed my fate and my course was no longer mine. I was catapulted into politics by the force of circumstances. But I am very proud that the Pakistan People's Party provided me, a woman, the opportunity to lead the nation. And it was not an easy task at a time when the military dictatorship said that a woman's place was behind the house and behind the four corners of her way. Many believe that South Asian women leaders inherited leadership through assassination of loved ones in the family. But I believe that each one of us had also to play a part to win our own place. And I paid a political price, spending nearly six years in prison in one form or another, mostly in solitary confinement. Senior members of my party could not reconcile the to be led by a woman and one that was young, too. So they were bruising battles for leadership. But I gained a lot of experience in managing such a large political party. I found that the elite groups in the country also refused to accept a woman as a leader. I remember when I was elected, my supporters were jubilant. They danced in the streets but not my opponents. A well-known leader from a religious country gave a fatwa or an edict criticizing my election and declaring that Pakistan was an un-Islamic country for having voted a woman to power. Members of the religious parties and those who had fought the Afghan Jihad turned their political guns on me. They printed pamphlets calling upon people to assassinate me as part of their religious duty. They said I was a woman who had usurped a man's place in an Islamic society. <clears throat> so there were many challenges to face. But we proved in Pakistan 
that opportunists and fanatics would not dictate our agenda. And I believe that my victory was a victory for women everywhere, especially Muslim women. And while my opponents found a native calling me an Indian agent for supporting dialogue with India, the people of Pakistan supported me. That I was a woman had many consequences on my personal life too. I was expecting my first child when general elections were called. And I still remember reading the Pakistani paper in which it said General Zia soon will call elections because Bainsley Bhutto was expecting a baby. They thought a pregnant woman could campaign. Well, she could. She did. <laughs> and we won the elections that were called. But despite the people's support, just after 20 months, the entrenched establishment that had supported the nation, that had refused to bow to the people's will, toppled my first government. And the new regime, brought in by the security apparatus, failed to give Pakistan stability. The first attack on the World Trade Towers took place in that period. There was anarchy within Pakistan. We were on the threshold of being declared a terrorist state, where elections were held and I was re-elected Prime Minister of Pakistan. I realized that being a woman leader was very challenging. But I once asked a male leader what we female leaders could learn from them. And he replied in a simple word, increase. I asked another male leader what I could learn from them. And he told me that women leaders could not be successful because they lacked the killer instinct and were too kind to knife their opponents. <laughs> so there's a lot that men and women can learn from each other about referring perceptions on leadership. <coughs> there's a lot too that we can learn. We in the East can learn from the West, and those in the West can learn from the East. Particularly, I believe that people in the West need to appreciate that the East, and I speak of the Muslim nations in the East, are part of the same Judaic Christian civilization. Islam is a religion that sanctifies Abraham, Moses, and Jesus as prophets. A loving and tolerant religion whose image has been tarnished by fanatics on the fringe who preach the politics of poison. Ladies and gentlemen, I try to build a modern Pakistan. I remember fax machines were banned when I took over as Prime Minister of Pakistan. I remember women could not take part in sports because there was a ban on women taking part in sports. We lifted that ban. We introduced fax machines. We introduced satellites. We introduced internet and even CNN and Fox into Pakistan. <laughs> in modernizing our economy, we learned so much from the West. Introducing private sector financial institutions computerizing the stock market in the Central Revenue Department, making the State Bank of Pakistan our Federal Reserve Bank autonomous and reforming the corporate law authority. When my government assumed management of the economy, the country's growth rate was 2% and we tripled that to 6% in three short years. We brought down our fiscal deficit from 8% to 5%. And we doubled tax revenues from 7% of our GDP to 14%. The World Bank praised our energy infrastructure program, making it a model to the entire developing world. The World Health Organization gave me a gold medal in recognition of the investment that we made in the health of our citizens. And the health of citizens was very important, for world bodies had predicted that approximately 50 million child deaths could take place in South Asia in a decade. And of that astounding number, 50 million, 30 million were preventable through a simple program of immunization, health education, and health delivery. And it was to save the children that we promoted a mother and child health care program, training 50,000 village health workers to travel to the far-flung villages of Pakistan. We reduced the population growth rate from 3.1% to 1.9%. There was 
a wide range of issues from the economy to the social sector to the women's sector that we undertook to protect our women. We established women's police forces and women's courts. We ran television programs to demonstrate to the women of Pakistan domestic violence was a crime. And we created a women's bank run by women for women, although we allowed men to keep their money in it and they didn't do it. <laughs> it was a miraculous transformation of a society. We opened up education and we opened up minds. We opened up opportunity and we opened up foreign investment. Above all, we opened up minds and we opened up individual choice. We attacked prejudice and we attacked discrimination. Dear students, in my life of triumphs and my life of tragedies, I have found that you don't have to be strong and you don't have to be powerful to succeed. You just have to have the right ideas. And before I leave, I would like to recall a story about success with you. I once asked the president of a very strong nation the secret to his success. And he said his secret lay in two words. I asked, what are those two words? And he said, right decisions. I then asked him, how do you get to make the right decisions? And I got the reply experience. I asked, how do you get experience? And I was told by making the wrong decision. <laughs> experience, experience is a great teacher. And in this remarkable era of peace and freedom, where the dignity of an individual is acknowledged, I play my part. And I know that all of you here and beyond will play yours for a better future than all the yesterdays that we have known. Thank you very much. the differences in the uh, political view of the Kashmir dispute. And I believe it's important for both countries to build confidence by working towards safe and open borders, by permitting travel, by permitting trade. I look at Europe and I see that Germany and France ended a century of conflict and bloodshed by working towards a common market. I believe economic cooperation is very important to improving relations between the two countries. And if the countries of South Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Maldives could all get, get together in a common econ mark, economic market, I believe we could attract investment from all over the world and we could tackle poverty and alleviate poverty. So I believe it's important for India and Pakistan to appreciate that we have deferring perception on the issue of Kashmir, and while we work for confidence building on Kashmir to work simultaneously on other areas, there is a great degree of opportunity for us to build and improve the lives of our people. So, hi. Yeah, hi. <laughs> <laughs> argument for the relationship between political oppression and the birth of terrorism and, and political empowerment through violence. 
Another argument that I've heard from prominent figures as well is that it's poverty and income inequality in our societies that have actually led to that. Now, if we ignore any causality between oppression and poverty and income inequality, what is your, what, what, what is your opinion, opinion on that sort of argument per se? I think poverty is a very important issue to tackle. I think the war against terrorism should not blind us to the need of tackling poverty and improving the situation <coughs> so many people facing famine and hunger all over the world. But I'm unsure about the direct causal connection between poverty and terrorism. For me, it's a more political issue like political systems or political conflicts that actually radicalize people. When I look at the hijackers uh, who were involved in the attack on the World, World Trade Centers, most of them came from uh, middle-class families who were doing economically well. So I believe that the argument is still out on whether there is a causal connection between poverty and terrorism. Although poverty must certainly be dealt with and not ignored because we are so focused on the war against terrorism. Right, lady. <laughs> Um, in continuing the question on Islamist extremism, it seems to me that you're, you're implying that the causal relationship in Pakistan is between military regimes and Islamist extremism. But of course, Islamist extremism in Pakistan continued its consolidation during the uh, decade of civilian rule. Um, and the problem which needs to be looked at in more complex terms and more terms of perceptions, perceptions of the other, perceptions of the political system, whether or not it's democratic. Could you comment on that? I know, uh, I hear what you're saying, and I certainly agree with you that the situation is much more complex and needs a very careful study. And I hope that studies will be conducted on it. From my own perspective, I feel that uh, there was a lot of sympathy for the Taliban style of government between segments of our military and clerical <coughs> class which had been used to raise and recruit them, and that they believed that having defeated one superpower, they could defeat another. Secondly, I also recall that uh, the major attacks of terrorism, the two attacks on the World Trade Centers, the attacks on the uh, U.S. coaching, the attacks on the embassies in Kenya and Nairobi, of the two African embassies, the Bombay blast, so the Indian parliament blast, these attacks took place when the People's Party was out of power. So I sometimes felt, and I gave an interview to the Los Angeles Times before the World Trade Center attacks, I felt that my government was destabilized by Osama bin Laden and others. I remember 1989, he was called back to Pakistan, and he made a contribution of $10 million dollars. <coughs> because he believed that a woman's place, he believed in an Islamic society, and according to his interpretation of an Islamic society, a woman should not rule a Muslim country. And what they had done, a jihad against the Soviets, they felt that now the time had come to do it against the Americans. Whereas my party and I, we had a different uh, school of thought, and we felt that Islam proclaimed equality between men and women, and that women's rights had also to be respected. But after the events of 2001, um, Pakistan was asked to stand up with, and be counted as friend or foe. Pakistan decided to join the war against terror. Pakistan broke its relationship with the Taliban. Pakistan banned groups like Lashkar and Tayyaba, which we have welcomed and we have supported, despite our differences with General Musharraf. What worries me, though, is that the political parties that are moderate are being marginalized. And the political parties that have sympathy with the Taliban form of government and have publicly declared so, they have full freedom of movement, freedom of association, freedom of expression, freedom to govern. Nobody breaks up their majorities with horse trading to prevent them from forming governments. And so they could form <coughs> governments. And I worry about that. I worry about the fact that our educational curriculum has still not been reformed, despite reports by respectable NGOs about distortions on what uh, is the responsibility, duties, obligations of Muslim citizens. So I have a worry that it's a two-tire, that we have General Musharraf on top, who's taken a decision that Pakistan is to be an enlightened society and the Taliban are to be banned and their leaders are to be arrested. And then underneath that, an infrastructure that still remains where tomorrow, if the tension turns, 
perhaps these people could make a bid for power. Maybe I'm wrong, but I believe that the possibility exists today that the religious parties would make a serious bid for power because they're the only ones who are being allowed to operate. I hope I'm wrong, so I hope you're going to do some studies because I agree with you it's a complicated situation. We have time for one further question, if you'd be willing. Mine really has to do with business. If you look at if you look at the United States and you look at attracting investment, anything that's stabilizing, whether it's terrorism or the relationship with India, it's going to frighten people from if you were in from making and if investment is what is going to lead to investments in education and everything else, if you were in power, where would you focus your attention at this moment? Would it be terrorism? I mean, some would say that democracy has been hijacked in this country uh, as well. And everything is focused on terrorism. <laughs> <laughs> business is to be part of the solution. Would you say that focusing on India and, and making that actually happen in a viable way will then attract investment from here and from elsewhere? Where would you, where would you direct your attention? Uh, it's very important to deal with both issues. I don't think one can, uh, uh, I think it's important to fight the war against terrorism and I think it's very important uh, for Pakistan to obtain peace on the borders. It's important for Pakistan for that very peace to improve within its uh, with uh, India, and I agree with you 100 percent that investment will only go to a country where investors feel safe. Investment will go to a country where investors think they're going to make a profit. So I think it is a compliment that during my tenure we had massive investment in Pakistan, and I believe that is because we were able to diffuse tensions on the borders and give internal peace. And it worries me when I see a lack of investment now. Pakistan is receiving enormous international support and assistance. And despite that enormous support, we have nearly 60% of our people living on $1 or $2 a day. So nearly 60%, I mean, that's terrible. So many people in Pakistan are committing economic suicide because they don't get jobs, they're hungry, they can't face their children, they can't feed their children. And this is a prescription that's for disaster because if a terrorist goes to them and says, don't kill yourself, for free, do something for us, and we look after your families. So I think that the internal situation in Pakistan needs a lot of attention, and that while uh, we must fight the war against terrorism and improve relations with India, internally we need to undertake reforms that can make our markets competitive with other markets. And there was a lady. Okay, there's a lady. Elections are very important to begin the process of reform. But an election alone cannot resolve all the problems. There has to be a consensus amongst the federating units, a consensus amongst the elites, and the people at large for the direction of society. And a democratic country can help institutions evolve onto a better performance and greater viability. If democracy lasts in due course, judiciary will start becoming more independent. In due course, through the transparent and accountable and representative methods of a democratic system, we will be able to engage in reform. But I used to believe that an election alone could resolve the problems. It can't. And now I spend part of my time trying to create an awareness to help facilitate the emergence of a consensus within Pakistan that all we Pakistanis need to bury what political differences we have to agree on a core charter for democracy, a core constitution, core institutions, like in India, when I look at India, they have an election commission, and irrespective of who wins the election, they don't try and change the results. They have a judiciary that is respected for its independence, so people who get charged, they know that they're going to get an independent hearing, 
They have an army that does not intervene, no matter if there is a crisis, for example, in Gujarat State. And that's the kind of consensus that we also need to create within Pakistan. But the first step for it will come with an independent and free election. My concern is that if military dictatorship continues to grow, the modern forces will be weakened, the religious parties will be strengthened, and then tomorrow we could once again face another catastrophe, as I hope we never do, but we did face it when we neglected democracy in Afghanistan.